Hey everybody, I was going to make a sarcastic note about the dearth of plant pathology information, but nothing sounded good, so I'm just going to start. Most information on microbiology on YouTube emphasizes dangerous human pathogens and might include something about the microbiome. It makes sense. We've all been sick, and very few of us have had to deal with plant pathogens in any capacity. If you have dealt with plant pathogens, chances are you didn't go see a plant pathologist to diagnose your poor petunias. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that most people on YouTube don't study plant pathology very deeply. Still, I think it's a cool subject, so I'm going to talk about it. And by it, I mean Botrytis cinerea. That's how I'm going to pronounce it. Leave me alone. If you go and search for this organism on YouTube, the first two results you get are a clip from a cooking show and an ad for a fungicide. The ad is strange. Neither are very useful for actually understanding what Botrytis actually is or why it's important. Another video I found is more educational, but only has about 4,000 views, and if you did watch it, you probably were already familiar with Botrytis. So I want to do what the kids call a deep dive, without spending an hour discussing it. As a side note, in both the description and the video, I'm going to be showing the citations for where I got my sources from. A lot of educational YouTube channels don't do this, and I think it's really annoying, considering that if you get your information from a source, you should almost always cite it. Let's begin. Botrytis cinerea is a necrotrophic plant pathogen and the causative agent of gray mold and noble rot, which we'll talk about, in anywhere from a few hundred to a thousand species, including strawberries, blueberries, and grapes, to name a few. Okay, so what do I mean by necrotrophic? It might seem obvious what it is, but I'm also implicitly comparing it with another kind of pathogen. There are necrotrophs and biotrophs, making their pathogenicities completely different. Obviously, this isn't the end-all, be-all of fungal pathogens. There aren't just necrotrophs and biotrophs necessarily, but it's a good delineation. Biotrophs feed on living host cells, while necrotrophs invade and kill plant tissue and then feed on it. Botrytis cinerea is a necrotroph, meaning it is feeding on dead plant tissue. Botrytis cinerea is in the Ascomycete phylum and also in the Sclerotiniaceae family. Yes, I know, it sounds weird. Which includes many other plant pathogens that we may discuss in future videos, such as Sclerotinia sclerotiorum. Gray mold disease causes anywhere between 10 and 100 billion US dollars every year in economic losses. Though exact information is hard to find, but it's clearly a problem. But it's one you don't hear about because unless you grow plants for a living or do research in plant pathology, you probably haven't even heard of it. The life cycle of Botrytis cinerea is interesting, to say the least. Microbial fungi are different from bacteria in that the fungi often sporulate and have specific life cycles. There's going to be a little bit more terminology to go through, so bear with me. Mycelia is the white fuzzy stuff that you might sometimes see outside or on food that's been left out for too long. They are composed of these thread-like structures called hyphae. The mycelia of Botrytis cinerea produce conidiophores, which in turn produce conidia, which are non-modal asexual fungal spores. Under more adverse conditions, like winter, sclerotia are more prevalent, which are hardened mycelium that take advantage of dead plant tissue on the ground, and are also vital for overwintering into the next season. Many microscopic fungi have asexual and sexual stages, termed anamorphs and teleomorphs. It's a confusing subject, but it needs to be at least mentioned because the naming convention has changed over the last 10 years. Previously, the anamorph and the teleomorph had different names and were placed in different genuses. For this example, the anamorph is Botrytis cinerea, and the teleomorph, or teleomorph, honestly, I don't care, is Botrytis fucaliana. No, that's not a joke. I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding. Here's his name. For the anamorph, the asexual stage involves the germination of conidia from conidiophores, 
which are attached to mycelia, as we've mentioned. The conidia then germinate and infect plant tissue. The gray mold that results can in turn release conidia once again. Conidia is also the primary method of spore dispersal by Botrytis cinerea. However, sclerotia can also germinate to produce mycelium, which can also start the process all over again by producing conidia fours and so on. For the teleomorph Botryotinia fucoliana, for the teleomorph Botryotinia fucoliana, sclerotia are fertilized by microconidia, which function as spermatia here. Very briefly, Microconidia and macroconidia are both types of conidia. The conidia from the asexual stage is macroconidia. In fact, if someone is simply saying conidia, then it's macroconidia that's most likely being referred to. Unfortunately, I can't find a solid definition for spermatia other than it's a non-modal sex cell. If someone in the comments wants to confirm, I would appreciate it. Nevertheless, the microconidia fertilize the sclerotia and induce the formation of apothecia, which are the sexual structures of Botrytis cinerea. Apothecia give rise to asci, which are sac-like structures where ascospores are produced. Ascospores germinate and infect living plant tissue. Asci are the defining features of members of the ascomycete fungal phylum. The telomorph, or sexual stage, is far less common in the field than the asexual stage. There are many parts of the life cycle that remain unanswered, and figure 2.1 from the book Botrytis, The Fungus, the Pathogen, and Its Management in Agricultural Systems, is a great resource, and the primary book I've been using for this video. There is also a good figure from the Plant Disease Diagnostic Clinic at Cornell. I doubt I could share the images without getting into trouble, so I'll link them in the description. Management takes different forms. Currently, the way to deal with gray mold is often through horticultural or chemical practices. Horticultural practices include preventing fruit falling to the soil and making sure water condensation doesn't occur on leaves. Since Botrytis cinerea is very effective in high humidity, like many other fungal plant pathogens. Another practice is ensuring that there is enough airflow between canopies and preventing excessive canopy growth. Chemical means are also very common, but they present many problems. Fungicide resistance among Botrytis isolates is becoming increasingly common. Fungicides for Botrytis, like many fungicides, are also potentially harmful to human and environmental health. I could say a lot more about chemical and horticultural control, but that could take up an entire separate video. Biological control, which is using microorganisms as antifungal agents, has also become more of a possibility, especially as an alternative to fungicides. Of course, I can't go through the section without mentioning the Trichoderma genus. Trichoderma species are well-known biocontrol agents against many fungal pathogens, Botrytis cinerea being one of them. Due to the mountain of research done on Trichoderma, they're easily some of the most studied biocontrol agents. You can find biofungicide Trichoderma projects right now, for example. Other biocontrol agents include Eulocladium, various yeasts, especially in grapes, bacteria, including Bacillus and Pseudomonas species, Gliocladium species, Clonostachys rosea, and many more. Like I said, I could go into a lot more detail, but I'm going to stop it here. Metriotinia is part of, I guess, an officially outdated naming scheme. The fact that there were two names for what is effectively the same species, just with different reproductive stages, was confusing and did not go overlooked by the mycological community. An effort was launched in 2011 to make the naming scheme more streamlined, which resulted in the concept of one fungus, one name. I'll probably have to make a future video going into more detail, but the basic idea is that, in the case of two or more synonyms for the same thing, one name should be used as priority for naming purposes. For this example, for Botrytis scenaria, it seems that most would recommend Botrytis feature as the one name for every sexual stage, retiring Botryotinia. I'll just leave it here, since going into more detail would bog down this video. And like I said, I'll probably have to make a future one. Okay. We could talk about a good thing about Botrytis. So there is at least one case where Botrytis scenario has a beneficial function. The condition is called noble rot. 
which is when the presence of Botrytis scenario combined with specific weather conditions can result in a much sweeter wine. However, it's been shown that it's the particular weather conditions, not the Botrytis isolates, that result in noble rot. Also, for anyone looking this up, be careful if you go on Uniprot. It will say that Botrytinia fucaliana is the noble rot fungus. I don't believe this is the case. It's just Botrytis or Botrytinia or whatever. It's the isolate, not the sexual stage that determines this. There's no difference between the Botrytis of noble rot and the Botrytis of gray mold. They're the same isolates. There's a video by someone with a far better voice than me that goes into more detail from the wine perspective. And I'll mention in the video and in the description. I got so tired of the white background on LibreOffice Writer that I had to turn it black and then gray because I couldn't see anything. Botrytis is a destructive necrotrophic plant pathogen that can infect almost any plant tissue and cause disease in almost a thousand known plant species. But it's alright because it makes a good wine. The end. Go away. Botrytis these no 